The waiting room is empty. So hello, everyone. My name is Melanie Mead from SOFO, the Southport, Southport Natural History Museum. And we're very happy to have Joe Rao with us tonight. Uh, we're co-sponsoring this event with the Hamptons Observatory so that we can all learn whether we can really say anything about the weather that's accurate. I mean, it might be, it might not be, but we're gonna find out. I would ask everyone though, to turn off your cameras and mics for now. And Joe will give us his presentation. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, Joe. All right, well, thank you very much. And a uh, very pleasant good evening to all of you. Um, it is uh, rather chilly out there. And uh, we are uh, going to talk over the next hour or so about not just weather, but also astronomy as well. A lot of people, you know, take pot shots at the uh, at the weather forecasters on TV and radio. Sometimes they'll say, you know, you can't forecast. What do you, you, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, is there a better way? What are you using to forecast? And uh, some are wondering about maybe if there's a connection between what's going on outside of our atmosphere with celestial bodies like the sun, the moon, the planets, could they possibly have a say in uh, the weather or our climate? And we'll talk about that. We'll touch upon that over the next hour in what I'm, I'm calling the, the pseudoscience, because it's not, I mean, you cannot go to a college and uh, sign up for astrometeorology because it's a subject that uh, does not exist. But what we're going to try to do tonight is try to tie together uh, both subjects, astronomy and meteorology, and see what we come up with. Um, I'm going to uh, first off uh, tell you that I'm going to give a, this is going to be a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to uh, go through the process here of sharing my screen with all of you. And um, let's go right here to, uh, hang on for a second. We'll go from the uh, current slide. And there we go. I want to thank uh, both uh, agencies uh, who have signed into this uh, talk tonight. First, the folks over at the Hampton Observatory. And also on the east end of Long Island, we have the South Fork uh, Natural History Museum and uh, Nature Center. They are the two that are sponsoring uh, this presentation tonight. And from time to time during this uh, next hour, what will happen is that I might pause for four or five seconds. And the only reason why I will do, be doing that is to wet my whistle or to uh, lubricate my throat uh, with, uh, with a soft drink uh, beverage. Uh, but uh, generally, you'll be hearing me uh, talking uh, almost nonstop from now until at least eight o'clock. And after it is all over, said and done, you all may unmute yourselves. And uh, if any of you have a question as to what you uh, uh, heard me speak about, uh, I'll be very happy to try to answer that question for you. Uh, so with that having been said, let's talk about astrometeorology. Now, if you are an amateur or professional astronomer, then this is a book that you should certainly have uh, on your desk and uh, within arm's reach uh, at the start of each year. This is the Observer's Handbook put out every year by the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. In this handbook are all sorts of tables and information concerning uh, most anything celestial that you need to know about. The positions of the planets, sunrise, moonrise, moonset, um, conjunctions between uh, the planets, um, meteor showers that are scheduled for the year. Uh, if there are any comets that may brighten our skies, this uh, handbook will tell you about it. Eclipses, uh, any eclipse of the moon or sun will be carried in great detail with maps and charts in the Observer's Handbook. And in fact, uh, the Observer's Handbook, which I've yet to receive for 2024, I'm sure, will have many pages about the big, big celestial event, in case any of you are not aware, April 8th of next year, the second Monday of April, we're going to be treated here in the southern and eastern United States to a total eclipse of the sun. That's going to be big news. It may not be uh, on the calendar of most right now, but I assure you, once we get past New Year's uh, Day and uh, we begin to get closer to that event, it'll be exactly 100 days to April 8th 
on New Year's Eve. And as we get closer, you'll be hearing more and more about the day of darkness, the day when the sun will uh, black out for several minutes over portions of the uh, eastern and southern United States. The thing I want to point out about this book, this handbook, is that everything that you see in it or read in it is precise. If, for example, this handbook tells you that the sun is going to rise at 722 a.m. on uh, January 3rd, mark your calendar, it will happen at 722. For the eclipse coming up uh, in April, if it says that the moon shadow is going to touch down on the surface of the Earth in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, at uh, 1113 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 16 hours and 13 minutes Greenwich Time, mark your word, it will happen at 1613 or 1113 on your clock here in the Eastern Time Zone. Everything is, for the most part, precise and to the minute. I mean, it's not something that if you, you know, open the book and you, you look up, let's say, uh, a lunar eclipse, you say, oh, well, it's going to happen around February 25th. It might happen on the 23rd or the 26th. There's a, there's a wide range. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen in astronomy. Astronomy is a very precise science, and not too many things in astronomy take place that are off by any major degree, and that's why the handbook is very important. If you're into astronomy, if you're into uh, space and want to know exactly when something is going to happen up in the sky, you get the Observer's Handbook, which provides you with uh, precise and exact information. Now, when it comes to weather, it's something completely different. Uh, I know a lot of people would love to have a book that would tell you, oh, I'm, I've got a, a wedding planned on September 1st of next year. In fact, I do have a wedding planned on September 1st next year. My daughter's getting married. I'd love to know what the weather would be like on that day. Will it be a beautiful day or will it be a day of showers? Or how about the 4th of July? Or how about Christmas? Will we have a white Christmas this year or maybe next year? It would be wonderful if you had a, a book like the Observer's Handbook that will tell you precisely, exactly, that a weather event is going to occur on a specific date. Well, actually, you have not just one, but two such books. You have the Old Farmer's Almanac. I don't know how many of you have purchased a copy for 2024. The Old Farmer's Almanac, which dates back, it's been continuously published since the year 1792. And then we have simply the Farmer's Almanac, not the Old Farmer's Almanac. You see the 1792 for the Old Farmer's Almanac, and this Farmer's Almanac, since 1818. So it's been around for um, maybe about 20 years less than the old farmer. But both of these publications come out, usually in August. People snap them up at their bookstores and uh, magazine stands. And then they consult these books because they, they want to know what it's going to be like. They provide weather forecasts for you know 12, 14, 16 months in advance. And the question is, how do they do it? How, how is it possible to forecast the weather? Now, every night you may turn on your television set and you may watch somebody like Lee Goldberg on Channel 7 or Lonnie Quinn on Channel 2 or Mr. G on Channel 11. And there'll be cases where all three of those guys and even some of the other people on the other stations, they'll say, well, we've got a storm coming our way about Monday of next week, but we're not sure it might be coming as early as Sunday, or it might hold off until Tuesday, and we think it might be rain, but if it's cold enough, it might be snow. All of these if, ands, or buts, and yet they're trying to forecast only a few days in advance. And yet here's the Farmer's Almanac, or the old Farmer's Almanac, and it's giving you forecasts that are, you know, almost a year or more in advance. How do they do it? How, are they, how is it possible that you, they, they can come up with such long-range or long-term forecasts? Well, a lot of people, and you know, the funny thing is, is that there are, with both publications, secret formulas. I could remember, in fact, uh, the uh, editor of the Farmer's Almanac, Ray Geiger. And Ray Geiger was the editor for 60 some odd years. And back when I was growing up as a kid in the Bronx, Ray Geiger occasionally would make appearances on TV shows such as, uh, how many of you, now I'm really going back, the Mike Douglas Show or Art Linkletter's House Party. And whenever he showed up, uh, on these TV shows, he'd always carry a little 
look like a little treasure chest <laughs> with a little lock on it. And let's say Art Linkletter or Mike Douglas would say, so what is that? He, and Ray Geiger would say, the secret formula is in this chest and I'm not allowed to open it up and I'm not allowed to tell anybody, but what secret formula? The formula for making long range weather forecasts, which had been handed down from generation to generation through the 1900s, the 1800s, this formula, which purportedly or supposedly tells you how to make long range weather predictions. I'm sure that any meteorologist worth his salt would love to have that in his or her hands. So how's it done? Maybe it's done using the moon. The moon, of course, goes through cycles, 28 days, uh, and, and also uh, can vary in its distance from the Earth. Maybe the uh, cyclical nature of the moon has something to do with the uh, climate and weather here on the Earth. And maybe that's part of the uh, secret formula that the almanac uses. In fact, in the old farmer's almanac, this is about 20 or 30 years ago, they had a table, they showed a table that presumably told you how to foretell the weather through all of the lunations of each year, forever. And this uh, table was created uh, back in the 1830s by a gentleman named Dr. Herschel for the Boston Courier. And it first appeared in the old farmer's almanac in 1834. Uh, it's based upon the moon. The time of change is when the moon uh, goes through its phases. So when it goes to, let's say, well, let's see, uh, November 28th, we had a, I believe we had a, no, the 27th, the 27th on Monday, we had a full moon. And I, it went uh, through the change. It became a full moon at something like 4.30 in the morning. So 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., that's when the moon turned full back on Monday. What does that mean in terms of the weather? According to this, if it were summertime, we'd get rain. If it was winter, we'd also get rain. Did it rain on Monday? I don't even know anymore. I can't even, we haven't had very much in the way of rain this week. But anyway, this uh, table was utilized by Dr. Herschel to make long range predictions using the phases of the moon. And uh, the, the, the uh, farmer's almanac, the old farmer's almanac says, while the data in this table are taken into consideration in the year long, long range uh, uh, weather forecast for the old farmer's almanac, they rely more on projections of solar activity, what's going on on the sun. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in this talk. Now, here's a gentleman. He looks very, very distinguished, doesn't it? His name is Elias Loomis. And in 1868, he published a, uh, a uh, big, thick triest on meteorology and uh, wrote a whole lot of stuff about weather and weather forecasting or whatever. And one of the things that he suggested was that the moon has a most definite say in the weather patterns uh, here on the earth. He pointed out in his uh, book, he said, well, we know that the moon causes the tides. We know that twice a day, the, the oceans rise and fall because of the moon's gravity. And we can use the tidal forces of the moon to make projections of when we're going to have high tides and low tides, not just for next week or next month, but for many, many years in advance. And it was Loomis's uh, conviction that the atmosphere is very much like the ocean. And he said, well, why can't we have tides high above our heads in the ocean? And if that be the case, why can't we use the tidal effects of the moon to make forecasts long range of possible storms or possible times of fair weather? It seems certainly like a, like a good uh, uh, suggestion. And in fact, uh, sometimes the, uh, the sky and the clouds themselves almost look like something that you would see on the ocean surface. What you're seeing right now is a very unusual cloud pattern. This is what's known as a Kelvin Heimholtz wave cloud. And it's caused by strong vertical shear, winds that blow uh, in the high levels of the atmosphere, faster at the upper levels of the atmosphere versus the winds that are blowing at the lower levels. And where the twain or where the two boundaries meet, you sometimes end up getting clouds that look just like this. 
And it does, in a way, look like ocean currents or ocean waves, doesn't it? And in fact, if they, this is just a static or still shot, take a look at this now. This was taken from uh, the top of a mountain. I guess you could say that we're looking at an undercast because the mountain top was above the clouds here. But look at the way the clouds in this time lapse are moving. If that doesn't look like the ocean, I don't know what does. I mean, it, it's, it's waving uh, just like uh, the ocean floor or the ocean uh, surface. And maybe, just maybe, uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Loomis uh, had something there when he said that the atmosphere uh, sometimes may react very much like uh, the ocean uh, and uh, because of the moon. Uh, again, this is uh, something that is not generally accepted today by most meteorologists. Most meteorologists think about this more as folklore than anything else. Here's a interesting little anecdote here. The moon and the weather may change. And by the way, this is a non, I don't know who came up with this line, but I found it in a book called Eric Sloan's Weather Almanac, published in the 1950s. The moon and the weather may change together, but change of the moon does not change the weather. If we'd had no moon at all, and that may seem strange, we'd still enjoy weather that's subject to change. In other words, the moon has nothing to do with the change in the weather. Absolutely nothing to do with uh, uh, any uh, possible future storms or any uh, fair weather that comes our way. So just forget about the moon. It, it has nothing to do with the weather. Well, actually, there are people out there who believe that the moon may have something to do with the weather, the motions of the moon. Here's a gentleman who I'm sure none of you recognize, although for one year in 1966, he was on television here in New York. He was the local uh, weathercaster for WCBS Channel 2, and his name is Harry Geis. Harry uh, is an import from California. He uh, came from California at the request or the bequest of the CBS management. You see, up until about 1966, if you turned on your TV to watch weather, just about everyone save for one station, and that station was Channel 4 in New York. Uh, just about all the other television stations in New York from the 1950s into the early 60s had women doing the weather. Uh, Channel 11 had a young lady by the name of Gloria Ocon. Maybe some of you remember, she used to advertise Arnold bread while singing about the bread. She also did the weather for Channel 11. And uh, on Channel 2, and I remember this lady, Carol Reed, I, I didn't remember Carol Reed so much for her weather forecasting ability, but at the end of each forecast, regardless of how the weather was going to be, she always ended it with, and have a happy. Carol Reed was a very, very popular figure in New York. But in 1966, NBC uh, sent uh, their weather forecaster, his name is Tex Antoine, and he used to have a character called Uncle Wethby. Uh, he used to dress up Uncle Wethby at night. He moved to Channel 7, and Channel 4 made this announcement. We are going to have a legitimate, a real Meteorologists do our weather from here on, and that person's name was Dr. Frank Field. And by the way, Frank Field lived to the ripe old age of 100. He passed away uh, earlier this year in March, but Frank Field eventually became a legend in New York weather. And part of the reason was that he was a legitimate meteorologist. He worked for the National Weather Service. At one time, it was the U.S. Weather Bureau. Now it's the National Weather Service. And then he moved on. He was the first one to show radar and satellite pictures. Well, competitor Channel 2 said, well, if they're going to get a real meteorologist, a real guy of science, we've got to get one too. And so they, uh, they said to Carol Reed, I'm sorry, you're done. And they brought in from California the gentleman you see on your screen, Harry Geis. And Harry Geis had a little thing that he, no other TV meteorologist or weather forecaster did. He not only gave you the forecast for the next few days, but he also claimed that he was able to make long range weather predictions. And so when he got settled in at Channel 2, the management of Channel 2 said, okay, Harry, do your stuff. And on Columbus Day, 1966, Columbus Day weekend, 1966, Harry Geis, stepped before the cameras and said, I have an announcement to make. We're going to have a big snowstorm on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day of this year. Big snowstorm. 
And, you know, we had not had uh, very many snowfalls in the New York area. The last one was uh, early on uh, in 1961. So it had been a few years since we had snow in New York, but to actually step forward and guarantee a snowstorm, a big one, that was something else. And the interesting thing about Harry Geis was that whenever there was a holiday, he'd always remind people when it got around to Veterans Day, he said, well, good weather for the veterans out there, but don't forget we're causing, calling for a big storm just in time for Christmas. And when Thanksgiving came along, oh, don't forget the, the Christmas season's about to be, you should all get your Christmas shopping done early. Don't be late because if you wait until Christmas Eve, you're gonna run into a pack of snow, a big storm. I mean, you know, this is this is amazing. You don't see anybody on television today doing something like this, but Harry Geist did. And people, soon word of mouth, people remember the, the forecast. Well, when we had uh, Christmas 1966, looky what we had. This is a map uh, from the National Weather Service showing the time frame from uh, the 23rd to the 26th of December. And you can see in the shaded areas of white, as you can see in the legend here, there was four to 10 inches of snow. That included much of the Hudson Valley of New York, Long Island, New York City. And then in the blue areas, there was 10 to 20 inches. And look in the dark shades of blue here, these splotches here, 20 inches or more of snow. And it came just when Harry Guy said that we were gonna have a major snowfall, here it is. And I mean, we're not just talking about flurries. We're talking about a big, big snowstorm. Amazing, right? Incredible. And here's the front page of the New York Times on Christmas morning. Snow brings city white Christmas travel snarled. Emergency is declared. Sanding and snow removal equipment rushed out. And remember when I commented about Harry Geis and how he said, get your Christmas shopping done before the big storm arrives. Well, you could see the look on this woman's face. Here she is, one of the uh, latecomers in doing shopping on Christmas Eve, walking through the snow. I guess it wasn't really a very uh, fun thing. I remember this storm, by the way. I mean, maybe some of you of a certain age remember it. It has gone down in history because that night, Christmas Eve night, we had thunder and lightning. It was referred to as the Donner and Blitzen snowstorm. I mean, we had everything with that storm, heavy snow, gusty winds, lightning and thunder. And the, the hero of the day uh, was Harry Geis, because again, he met. So how did he do it? How was it possible that he was able to make a four? Well, like I said it earlier, was it due to perhaps the cycle, the cyclical motion of the moon? Well, interestingly, there is a cycle known as the Metonic cycle. It's named after a Greek by the name of Meton, who lived around 500 BC. And it was Meton who noticed that after a period of 19 years or 235 lunar months, synodic months as we call them, a synodic month is equivalent to 29.53 days approximately. And after that 19 year period, the new and full moons will return to the same days of the year. It was the basis of the ancient Greek calendar and is still used for helping to calculate movable feasts such as Easter. In other words, I told you uh, a few minutes ago about the full moon. We had a full moon on Monday. Monday was November the 27th. We are in the year 2023. Well, I don't need a calendar. I can tell you right now with absolute certainty, with absolute surety, that in the year 2042, 19 years from now, we're gonna have a full moon again on that very same date, November the 27th. And 20 years early, uh, 19 years earlier, back in the year 2004, if you looked on your calendar, you would see that there was a full moon on November the 27th. So that's an interesting theory. Uh, maybe if the, the moon has anything to do with weather, maybe the same kind of weather, if it's attached to the, uh, to the movements of the moon, maybe the same kind of weather that occurred 19 years previous it will recur uh, this year. And, you know, so Harry Geis was promoting a big storm, Christmas time, 1966. So let's see, subtract 19 years from 1960, that's 1947. Was there any major storm that occurred around Christmas 
1947 here in New York. Oh, oh my goodness. Look at this. This is the New York Times from Saturday, December 27th, 1947. A record. Not anymore. We've had snows that have dumped a bit more snow than this, but still 25 inch snow cripples the city. Long Island, oh. oil traffic slowed. Thousands marooned. The food, thankfully, was ample. But look at this. So did Harry Geis look back on weather maps from 1947 and align them with the with the cycle of the uh, metonic cycle of the moon to make a prediction about a big storm in 1966 based upon this 1947 storm? Well, if that theory is correct, then in 1985, we should have had another big snowstorm, right? We should have had another major snowfall in 1985, right around Christmas time. And I'm sure you all remember that big storm in Christmas 1985, right? Right? What do you mean you don't remember? Well, you don't remember. And you know why you don't remember? Because there wasn't a big storm in 1985. There was no big snow around Christmas in 1985. So it doesn't seem to work that, you know, you have the same kind of weather every 19 years. At least this metonic cycle theory doesn't work. So maybe there's something else, something else that needs to be added to uh, a lunar cycle theory for weather. How about the distance of the moon? Now, the moon doesn't go around the Earth in a perfect circle. It goes around in an ellipse. Sometimes when the moon is far, far out from the Earth at about 252,000 miles away, what we call apogee, the moon appears somewhat smaller than when it's at the other end of its orbit, close to the Earth at 221,000 miles, which we call perigee. You can see these two moons, the one on the left taken at apogee, farthest from the Earth, the one on the right taken at perigee. And in fact, the news media has latched on to this now. Whenever the full moon occurs near perigee, we have something known as the super moon. Well, super moon. The moon appears about 13% or so larger than when the moon is at its farthest point from the Earth. Not so super. Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, the director of the Hayden Planetarium, often mocks the term super moon. He says, what if I went into a pizzeria and ordered a super pizza? If the super pizza was made the same way that the proportional size of the moon is, then I would have a pizza exactly half an inch bigger than the normal pizza. But in any case, the moon being closer to the Earth at the time of full or new moon phase means that we have a stronger tidal pull on the oceans, a stronger pull uh, that occurs. And perhaps that plays into the forecasts of, uh, of uh, weather for the, the moon. This gentleman certainly thought that that was a major uh, factor. His name is Stephen Martin Saxby. And in the year 1868, Mr. Saxby, and I, I don't know exactly, I, I think he was, well, he was a scientist, I don't think he was a meteorologist, but in 1868, he wrote a letter to the uh, local newspaper in his hometown of London, England, and he apparently uh, took note of the fact that the moon, the new moon, uh, in October of 1869, was going to be at its closest point to the Earth, perigee, and that the new moon was also going to be passing over the equator at the same time. And he said that that would lead to a major storm, a storm that could lead to flooding, a storm that, oh my goodness, he, he made it sound like it was going to be one of the worst uh, cataclysms of all time. But then after that letter was published in the Times of London, the standard of London, I should say, um, a lot of people wrote to the newspaper and said, well, that may be all well and good, but Mr. Saxby or Professor Saxby missed one thing. He didn't tell us where that storm was going to be. Will it be here in the United Kingdom? Will it be across the big pond in the United States? Where is this supposed major storm going to occur? And so the newspaper actually had to get back to Saxby and say, could you please tell us where this major tempest that you spoke about in October of 1869, where is it going to take place? Where is it going to occur? And so he wrote another letter, which was published in the uh, Standard of London on September 16, 1869, about two weeks before the 
a big event. And he wrote, the warnings apply to all parts of the world. Effects may be felt more in some places than in others. It is painful to have to forebode evil, but better thus than to merit self-reproach under circumstances which might lead to permanent regrets. Could I save just one life? It would be very cheaply purchased in making better known certain laws of nature. Blah, 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 blah. In other words, Saxby knew that with the moon so close to the earth, what we call a spring tide, nothing to do with the seasons, but from the German de Springen, the tide seems to spring up at the time of new and full moons. And with the moon much closer than normal in early October of 1869, that there would be tides that would be running much higher than normal, even without a storm, there'd probably be some form of coastal flooding near the shorelines. And if there is a storm, and he was somewhat alluding to that, well, it, it's going to occur somewhere. He didn't say where. He didn't. Uh, uh, he said the warnings apply to all parts of the world. So this was a, uh, an open-ended forecast. This was something that uh, you know could apply to any place on the on the surface of the earth. Who would believe something like that? Well, guess what? This guy did. His name is Frederick Allison. And Frederick Allison lived in Nova Scotia. And he had a weather column that was published in his local newspaper each week. The, the weather column that Frederick Allison wrote basically was a summary of the weather events that took place the previous week or the previous month. He rarely, if ever, forecasted the weather. Uh, but in this particular case, he somehow managed to hear about this prediction, if you want to call it that, by Stephen Martin Saxby. And Frederick Allison decided that he was going to take matters into his own hands. And so he published a forecast based upon the prediction of, um, of uh, Stephen Saxby in the, his local newspaper in uh, Nova Scotia. This was in the Halifax Evening Express, October 1st, 1869. And he wrote, I believe that a heavy gale will be encountered here on Tuesday next, the 5th of October, beginning perhaps on Monday night, possibly deferred to as late as Tuesday night. But between these two periods, it seems inevitable. Roughly speaking, the warmer it may be on the 4th, the more violent will be the succeeding storm. Apart from the theory of the moon's attraction as applied to meteorology, I love this. This is a little bit of a dis disclaimer here, which is disbelief by many. In other words, you know, apart from the theory that the moon's attraction can cause changes in our weather, which nobody in meteorology really believes, the experience of any careful observer teaches him to look for a storm at the next new moon, the 5th of October. And he published this on October 1st. Now, keep in mind, you make a forecast today on October 1st for, let's say, the 4th or 5th of October. It's no big deal. I mean, some TV stations in the New York market make 10-day predictions. That's no big deal. But of course, back in 1869, they didn't have satellite pictures. They didn't have radar. They certainly did not have the supercomputers that churn out short-term weather models that uh, many meteorologists today rely on to make predictions. Frederick Allison was basing all of this on the prediction made by Stephen Martin Saxby of the closeness of the moon, the new moon, on October the 5th, and also the fact that the moon was passing over the equator at the time and would cause major flooding at times of high tide and also maybe generate a major storm. So that's what that's what Allison based his forecast on in his uh, newspaper column. Little did Allison know, little did anybody know, that at the time that that forecast was uh, published, that there was off the southeast coastline of the United States, a hurricane, a hurricane. We didn't know about it, really. Uh, nobody really knew because, as I said, there were no satellite pictures. There was no radar. Very few weather observations from ships out at sea, which would later report the presence of the hurricane, but well after the fact. And here's where the hurricane was, presumably on October 1st. And here's where it was on the 2nd, on the 3rd, here's October 4th, and on the 5th, the storm made landfall somewhere in down east Maine. And then 
moved inland across Maine and into New Brunswick, Canada. And Nova Scotia was on the right-hand side of the uh, storm track. If you're going to be in a hurricane situation, that's probably the worst place to be because the winds are usually strongest to the east of the track of a storm. And in this particular case, Nova Scotia was getting battered, not just by rain, but by tremendous winds. It goes down in record, in fact, in Nova Scotia weather annals as one of the most severe storms ever recorded. This was a major, major storm with lots of wind, lots of rain, and also a goodly amount of destruction. I would think that Frederick Allison thought that he'd probably become pretty famous because after all, he made his prediction in his local newspaper in Halifax. But yet the name Frederick Allison is not really known uh, to this day. What is known is that, that this major storm that again hit parts of New England and the uh, Atlantic Canada region, this storm is still known to this day as the Saxby Gale or the Saxby Storm. So Stephen Martin Saxby got famous because he hit it by sheer accident, uh, calling for a big, big storm during that time frame that the, he had uh, indicated in the Standard of London. Many years later, this guy by the name of Joe Rayo uh, wrote a feature article for Weatherwise magazine. And by the way, if you have any interest in weather, you really ought to subscribe to Weatherwise. Uh, uh, it is read by amateur and professional meteorologists all over the United States. And in October of 2002, I had an article which said, I, I, it was entitled Moonstruck Meteorology, and I asked, is it lunacy to think that Saxby's Gale could recur this October? Because I you know, had some knowledge also of astronomy uh, using a computer model, a computer software, I had discovered that the position of the moon in October of 2002 would be very much similar to the position of the moon in October of 1869 when we had the Saxby Gale. It was going to be very close to the Earth. It was going to cross over the uh, equator. It was going to be at new moon phase. So I asked, is it possible that we could have another storm similar to Saxby's Gale in October of 2002? Of course, you can't base a forecast just on one simple storm, one simple uh, a forecast, uh, 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 one event. You need other events to back things up. And so I did some research and I found that on other occasions when we had a similar uh, lunar lineup of sorts, uh, we had some very interesting weather. And of course, also this type of uh, forecast occurring near the time of the September equinox and the mariners uh, who uh, were out at sea would often make reference to a line storm. The sun is crossing the line, they said. Uh, the equator, and it seemed like always within like a week or two of the equinox, there was some kind of major disturbance that took place. And of course, in most cases, that was probably a tropical cyclone or a hurricane. But it doesn't necessarily have to be confined to September. It could also be in March when we have another equinox, the vernal equinox. And here's a forecast. This forecast appeared in the New York Times on March 22nd, 1967. And this was uh, the US Weather Bureau, now of course known as the National Weather Service. Look at the forecast. Mostly cloudy today with a few snow flurries likely and then clearing this evening or tonight. High today in the upper 30s, low tonight near 30. So a few flurries, that's all that was being forecast by the weather. But it was also at the same time that the moon was at full phase and also at the time when the moon was at its closest point to the earth, perigee, and also when the moon was crossing the equator. These were the same conditions or criteria that Saxby made his infamous prediction back in 1869, except this was a full moon and not a new moon, but still. And looky what happened the next day. Snow flurries? Yeah, snow flurries. 10 inches of flurries, which surprised the city and clogged roads. Airlines and buses delayed, walking is precarious. Oh, it was, it was terrible. And here you see a picture of Anthony Tancredo Anthony Tancredo was the head of the U.S. Weather Bureau at Rockefeller Center uh, back then in 1967. Yeah, you win some, you lose some. And the storm, according to this story in the Times, had moved very much as the forecasters had predicted. Normally, 
a storm like this would give up little or no snow, said one meteorologist, said, said a man like trying to explain to his wife why he hadn't phoned when he missed the train. Uh, Mr. Tancredo, the meteorologist in charge, said that he was right only most of the time. The he, he compared it to good surgery that did not turn out well. According to Mr. Tancredo, the operation was successful, but the patient died. So anyway, that's, that's what happened in 1967. And then in 1993, March the 12th, 1993, we had what was referred to as the storm of the century. This storm brought heavy, heavy snow all the way down as far south as Mississippi and Alabama, all the way up through the Ohio Valley and into New England. And not only that, it produced a squall line down over Florida, which produced numerous severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. And near the storm center, the barometric pressure dropped to all time record lows in places like North Carolina and Virginia. This was one of the greatest storms on record. And P.S., it also occurred at about the same time that the moon was full and at the same time that the moon was crossing the equator and at the same time that the moon was near its closest point to the earth, perigee. So again, could it possibly be that uh, that lunar cycle has something to do with long range forecasts? Here's the New York Times uh, on the 14th of March. Storm paralyzes East Coast. Snow covers the South, 33 killed. A humbled Northeast hunkers down anew. Wow, what, a, what an amazing. So maybe along with the phases of the moon, maybe uh, the closeness of the moon has something to do and its position relative to uh, the, the Earth when it crosses the equator. Is that possible? Is that something that could factor in to weather forecasts? Well, getting back to my article in WeatherWise, I said in October of 2002, that the setup was very similar to what Saxby had in 1869. And so what I said was, all right, let's see what happens. Well, in late September of that year, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Kyle. Here's Puerto Rico. Here's the Dominican Republic. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And up to the upper left out of the field of view would be the mainland United States. Well, well, what would Hurricane Kyle do um, if indeed the moon had anything to say about it. Normally, when you look at a storm that's down in the Caribbean, usually it takes the following kind of path. Sometimes it'll take a path, taking it straight through uh, past uh, the, uh, the islands here of Haiti and Cuba and into the Gulf of Mexico. Or sometimes it would go north of the islands, up across Florida into the Gulf of Mexico. And more often than not, a track that would take it on a curved, smooth path near to the mid-Atlantic and then sweeping out to sea just offshore. Although sometimes the storms, as we have seen uh, with uh, the Saxby Gale and with other storms since, might make landfall in the Carolinas or somewhere in the northeastern United States. That's what you would normally expect, right? Well, take a look at the track that Hurricane Kyle took. I mean, this is crazy. This was almost looked like Kyle was drunk, uh, leading into that time frame in October. And look at this. Not only did we have the storm, you know, reach a certain point, then it looped around like this. There's Bermuda over here, and then made a big circular loop like that, grazing the Carolina coastline, and then finally dying out somewhere out to sea. Now, we know that the movement of storms, uh, hurricanes are based primarily on upper level winds, jet stream winds, but could the moon have had a say in this crazy, Path. I'll tell you, I've been into meteorology for over 40 years. I've rarely ever seen a crazy cockeyed path like this. But could it have been due to the moon? I don't know. I have no clue. But it was certainly something interesting to watch and track uh, in the days leading up to that time frame in early October, the time frame that where the moon was in a similar position relative to uh, Saxby's Gale in 1869. Now, earlier we mentioned the farmer, the old farmer's almanac, and they said, well, we don't use the moon, we use the sun, we use solar activity, uh, solar flares and sunspots. We base our predictions mostly on solar activity more than anything else. So that's interesting. Sometimes uh, the, the, when you look at the sun, it appears speckled with dark spots. Other times 
the sun appears totally blank. These spots are magnetic storms on the surface, or what we call the photosphere of the sun. Now, the photosphere is about 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but these magnetic solar storms are cooler. They're only about, oh, only, he said, eight or 9,000 degrees. But when you place an 8,000 degree area up against an 11,000 degree area, that 8,000 degree area is going to show up as appearing darker. And indeed, it looks like a, a spot on the sun. In fact, at one time, and when the people were looking at these things in the early days of the telescopes in the 1600s and early 1700s, there were people who actually thought that they were holes in the sun. But we know now, again, these spots are uh, due to, again, magnetic influences that are occurring on the face of the sun. And they occur in cycles. If we talk about lunar cycles, the sun has solar cycles too. At cycles of 11 years, we have periods when the sun has a lot of sunspots. And then uh, five or six years later, it fades out and we have blank uh, of solar activity for a while. And then it ramps up again five or six years later, and we have another solar maximum cycle. You could see here on this graph how the cycle occurs up and down, up and down, up and down over again, a period of about 11 years. So at 11 year intervals, we have sunspot maxima. And uh, it's during these times when we have a proliferation of sunspots, lots of solar activity, solar flares uh, occurring. And we've been able to track this now for many, many years. This is only for uh, the uh, 20th century going into the early 21st century. Now, this gentleman, John Eddy, uh, who was a uh, American scientist who studied sunspots and solar activity, took note of solar records. And uh, he took note of the fact that um, in, uh, in his uh, uh, scanning of forensic records, looking back over the years, that there were apparently uh, people who claimed that there were long periods when there were no sunspots. In other words, I, I just showed you a graph that shows you that they occur regularly, that the sunspot activity peaks regularly at 11 year intervals. And yet what bothered John Eddy was the fact that he was seeing reports going back into the uh, 1600s and 1700s that there was a paucity, a lack of sunspots over a period of many, many years. 30, 40, 50, 75 years, and hardly any sunspots. So Eddie said, I'm going to investigate this on my own. I'm going to look at the records myself to prove that, the, that this discussion is totally false, totally untrue. And as a result, he did do some uh, searching. He found, for example, uh, the study is done by this gentleman. His name is Edward Walter Maunder, and Maunder who lived in the late 19th century, uh, said, you know, from 1645 to 1715, there were hardly any sunspots. No sunspots, in fact, at all for long, long stretches. Eddie didn't really believe this until he did his own, you know, uh, look at the, the records. And he also found uh, other studies. This is uh, Gustav Sporer. And Sporer said th there was a period when there was a lack of any sunspots, from 1420 to 1570. Well, how in the world could he possibly make a statement like that? Sporo, who was also another 19th century uh, scientist, was saying that there were no sunspots during a time frame in the 15th and 16th century. How could he say something like that? Because the telescope was not invented until 1610. It wasn't after 1610 that we began to study the sun and took note of the uh, cycle of sunspot activity. So how could he possibly say that there were no sunspots in the 14 or 1500s when there was no instrument to, uh, to uh, back that claim up? But Sporer did his study a different way. He was a dendrochronologist and he studied tree rings. And he pointed out that during times when uh, there was a lot of wet weather and uh, the weather was unusually warm, that the tree rings were wide. And you can see here, look at this, how wide the tree rings were here. But also he pointed out that when the, the uh, uh, periods of dry weather and cold weather occurred, the tree rings were much thinner. 
much smaller. And he linked this up with solar activity. He said, well, you know, solar activity, when there's a lack of sunspot activity, it tends to be cold. And when there's a lot of sunspots, it tends to be unusually warm. So he took note of the fact that uh, during that period from 1420 to 1570, these tree rings were rather numerous and rather tightly wound together, indicating that, uh, hey, it was, it was cold and it was also rather dry, as opposed to uh, periods when there was a plentiful amount of sunspots and it was warmer and wetter. And here's another gentleman, John Dalton. He uh, was a British scientist and he lived uh, during the uh, 19th century and he looked back on records 1790 to 1830, he pointed out, again, a lack of any significant sunspot activity. And this cycle of uh, sunspots also coincided with a period of rather cold weather. It is known as the Dalton cycle, just like the uh, Maunder cycle is known as the Maunder minimum with the lack of any sunspots. It was very cold too. In fact, 1645 to 1715 was known as the Little Ice Age. Again, coinciding with the lack of any sunspots. During that period that uh, Dalton was studying uh, the weather in conjunction with sunspots, and this, by the way, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, before uh, about how uh, uh, the American scientist said this was a lot of hogwash. Well, it, it certainly was not. Uh, he later backed up the claim of, of Dalton and of Maunder and of Sporer and said, you know, John Eddy said, it, it seems to be true that the lack of sunspots seems to coincide with cold wet. Maybe it has something to do with uh, the weather, the cycle of the sun. And during that time frame, during the uh, 1790 to 1830 time frame, look at this. Everything was frozen in Holland. Uh, you could walk on the ice. And in the early 1800s, a gentleman by the name of Dickens, wrote a story which very soon now will become more and more evident on our airwaves, the story of the Christmas Carol about this gentleman by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. And that story, if you ever have seen it, was always placed in England during a period of cold and sometimes flaky or snowy weather. Now, I gotta tell you, if you go to England now around uh, Christmas time, there is a nine out of 10 chance that you're not going to see any snow and a nine out of 10 chance it's probably going to be by the standards of what we would be experiencing here in the United States, relatively balmy temperatures. Uh, they don't really see all that much in terms of cold wintry conditions around Christmas time anymore. But that was not the case in the early 1800s during that Dalton minimum during that time frame when there was a lack of sunspots that was pointed out by Dalton. Uh, it was cold at Christmas time. And yes, you could have snow in Great Britain and the United Kingdom at Christmas time. And that's why he, uh, Dickens set that, his story uh, in just such type of uh, weather, cold, snowy conditions. And here you see solar activity and climate on a much longer scale. Uh, now, we're, now we're going all the way back to like 1200 AD, all the way up to the current year and beyond. And right here, Right here, we have uh, a time frame where you could see the uh, graph indicates not quite a large stretch here for sunspot activity or solar activity coinciding with the Maunder minimum and the Dalton minimum. This is what was called the Little Ice Age. And then over here is uh, what we were experiencing during the late 20th century. During the late 20th century, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, we had really super sunspot cycles. We had lots and lots of sunspots occurring at the time of solar maxima. And uh, look at this, double, double sunspot peaks up here. And uh, here is where we were as we entered the 21st century right here. But take a look at this right here. This was a paper that was written by several Russian scientists, Zarkova et al back in 2015, not so long ago, eight years ago. And they pointed out that solar cycle 26 will be the beginning of the modern version of the Maunder or Dalton minimum. In other words, a 
paucity of sunspots and solar activity, which would lead to unseasonably cold weather throughout the Northern Hemisphere. You talk about global warming. Well, these scientists were saying, thanks to the sun, which is in full control of our weather and climate, that by the time we got to solar cycle 26, which would be not this cycle, but the next one in the 2030s, that we would see unseasonably cold weather thanks to the lack of any sunspot. How could they make such a prediction? Take a look. They pointed out that each time the sun reached its peak in the 11 year cycle, cycle 21, 22, 23, 2040, you notice what's happening? Each time we reached solar maxima, the number of sunspots at maxima was noticeably lower than the previous maxima. And so what they did obviously was just simply extrapolate. They said, okay, if this continues, we will have even lower sunspot activity and solar activity uh, for cycle 25, which is what we are into now and which is expected to peak sometime next year. And that by the time we get to cycle 26 in the 2030s, no sunspots, no solar flares, no major disruptions on the sun, and we'll be plunged into what they referred to as global cooling. Well, that's, that's certainly interesting, isn't it? Except for one problem. You see, they just did some simple extrapolation. They simply assumed in 2015 that this cycle that we're into right now would continue to show the same signs as the previous cycles of diminishing solar activity. But look at this. You see this? This is a coronal mass ejection from a major solar flare that took place back on Tuesday afternoon. And in fact, so far this cycle, sunspot cycle 25, we have been seeing more sunspots and more solar activity than we've had in any of the past three cycles. Remember I showed you that graph showing how each cycle was going down, 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 down? Well, all of a sudden, the sun has woken up. And in fact, tonight, after midnight, if you are so inclined to stay up that late, and maybe you could set your alarm clock and check frequently through the overnight hours, there is a prediction that we're going to have a major geomagnetic storm. And in the late night hours tonight or early tomorrow morning, we at the latitude of New York may get a chance to see something we don't often see, the northern lights, the aurora borealis, caused by this exceptional display of solar activity. Well, Mr. Zarkova, you wrote a good paper back in 2015, based it all on solar activity that was diminishing, but I'm afraid it's not going to work out, at least not for this solar cycle. And who knows, maybe by the next solar cycle, which you predicted a return of uh, another maunder minimum or another um, uh, uh, low point in the sun activity, which would lead to another little ice age, maybe, just maybe, that might not come true. In fact, it may, it may end up being exactly opposite to what you had forecast. So yeah, we did have periods in the 2010s where the sun was blank, but we also had periods, and we have it now, when uh, we see a lot of sunspots and solar activity. Gentlemen, you see on the screen now is Gavin Schmidt, and uh, he is a British climatologist, a climate modeler, and director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, right here in New York. About 10 years ago when I was at News 12, I had the opportunity to interview uh, Dr. Schmidt. And I asked him about this. I said, is there any correlation between sunspot activity and the climate of the Earth? And he said very rapidly and very quickly and very sternly, absolutely not. There is no correlation whatsoever. So then I said, well, Dr. Schmidt, how do you explain 1645 to 1715 when we had the little ice age and there was no sunspots? How do you explain the Dalton minimum? How do you explain this, these periods wherever there was no sunspots, there was, it was colder weather? And Dr. Schmidt said, the reason that that happened was because of a coincidence between what was happening here on the earth, a geophysical coincidence of volcanic activity. We had, he pointed out, during those same time frames, unusual volcanic activity. And when you have lots of volcanic activity, and if you have a few big volcanic eruptions that belch tremendous amounts of ash and dust, aerosol clouds into the atmosphere, the upper stratosphere, those clouds act as shields, if you will, or shades. 
and will cause sunlight not to get through or as much sunlight to get through. And if they, it reflects a lot of sunlight back, what's going to happen to the atmosphere? Correspondingly, it's going to cool down. One of the biggest eruptions ever recorded in 1815, the eruption that occurred out in the Philippines known as Tambora. And it put up a tremendous cloud which encircled the Northern Hemisphere. And in 1816, we had here in the United States, the year without a summer, the year that, well, in New England, it got so cold, it never did warm up, that it snowed in parts of New England in every month of the year, June, July, August, September. Again, the year without a summer, 1816. Not due, said Dr. Smith, to the Dalton minimum, which uh, occurred in that time frame, lack of sunspots, but because of volcanic activity, which prevented sun's rays from reaching the earth to their fullest extent. And then there are some who believe that the planets hold the key to um, the um, weather patterns that we have here in uh, the United States and around the world. Uh, for example, there was a, an alignment or proposed alignment that took place in the early 1980s. And in fact, there was a book that was written in 1974 called The Jupiter Effect, The Planets as Triggers of Devastating Earthquakes, written by two gentlemen, John R. Gribben, Stephen H. Plageman, and there was even a forward by the renowned science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. And they predicted that in 1982, with the alignment or near alignment of the planets, that it would pull on the sun and cause sunspots and flares, and that would lead to cataclysms, earthquakes, floods, all kinds of major weather phenomena. And see the problem, and this sold these guys, Plagemen and uh, Gribben, they made a lot of money from this book because they scared people. They got people, there was an interest and a lot of people got, the, the, the scientists, you know, meteorologists, they said, this is a lot of, you know what, this kind of stuff you would line your birdcage with. But nonetheless, these gentlemen, Plagemen and Gribben, made a lot of money. And when you make a lot of money, other people say, hey, we can do the same thing and we can make money. There were other similar books like Earthquake 1982 by this guy named Doug Clark, When Planets Align, also known as a syzygy. But you know what? 1982 came and 1982 went and there was no earthquakes, no devastating floods, no major storms of any. The only weird thing that happened in 1982 was on April the 6th of that year here in New York, we had a blizzard. Yeah, a blizzard. And uh, the opening day at Yankee Stadium was canceled because it was like 10 inches of snow. That was probably the most unusual and weirdest thing that happened weather-wise was a blizzard in New York in uh, April of 1982. But and, uh, generally speaking, nothing really significant happened weather-wise that year. Still, there are others who believe that you can predict the weather using the sun, the moon, and the planets. Now, this gentleman that is on your screen right now is uh, Jim Witt, and Jim has been a uh, long-term meteorologist. Uh, he is well-known and highly respected in the field of meteorology. He's been in the business now for over 50 years. He's on, you can hear him on Saturday mornings if you listen in the Hudson Valley on WHUD radio doing uh, the weather forecasts. You see, he's holding a calendar in his hand. That is Jim's long-range weather calendar, which he has been selling since 1986. Now, Jim originally was at the Lakeland High School in northern Westchester, and he started a weather club where he had young people at the high school who were interested. They would come in on their own time, uh, either before classes started or stayed after classes had ended. They actually had a weather station. For goodness sake, they even were able to get from uh, a, uh, a station, an able station down in uh, Texas, radar, their own radar. I mean, this is, a, this is a high school. And yet, all of these youngsters who were part of this weather club, which was started by Jim, have gone on to become ace forecasters, well-known in the field of weather, at the uh, Weather Service, at NOAA. All of them learned their stuff uh, from the Lakeland Weather Club. And uh, this goes back now over half a century ago. Here's a picture of Jim with uh, one of his students. Uh, he's looking over the student's shoulders. He's plotting a map. All these kids 
learned how to forecast. All these kids learned weather from Jim. Now, remember when I told you about Harry Geis making that amazing prediction about the snowstorm 1966? And by the way, after that, after 1966, Harry went back to California. He said, I, I've had it with New York weather. <laughs> I, I like it a lot better in California. And he was replaced by another guy who did long range forecasts by the name of Gordon Barnes. But in any case, when, when the snowstorm of 66 occurred, uh, Jim wrote to Harry Geis and asked for a meeting. And uh, Harry uh, Geis uh, did give uh, Jim a chance to meet with him at CBS Channel 2. And Jim told uh, Harry Geis about what he was doing with the kids at uh, Lakeland High School. And Harry Geis told Jim, you know what? I've never told this or done this for anybody, but I'm going to do it just for you. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you some hints, some hints now as to how I make my long range weather predictions. I said, I'm not going to tell you the, the, the whole story, but I'm going to tell you what I do to a degree, and then I'm going to let you try to figure out for yourself, try to fill in the gaps, come up with your own methodology and uh, see if you can figure out for yourself how to make long range forecast. This is 1966. So by 1986, Jim was ready. Jim had spent a long time in studying and making long range forecasts and long range predictions. And so by the time we got to the 1980s, Jim was making his own long range weather forecasts based upon apparently what Harry Geis used, the sun, the moon, the planets. And he used to go on the air at WHUD and say, if any of you wanna hear my long range weather predictions for the upcoming year, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to WHUD and we'll mail out my predictions. And the owner at that time of WHUD called Jim into his office and said, you know, I think we have a thing here. He said, how about if we make a calendar? We'll, we'll make up a calendar, a very nice looking calendar, and you'll have your long range predictions for the upcoming year in the calendar. And we'll sell the calendar and we'll make some money off of it. And Jim came back with another idea. He said, how about if we do this? We'll make the calendar, I'll do the long range predictions, but instead of collecting the money for ourselves, why don't we use the money for charity? And it was then that Jim started what he called the Hope for Youth Foundation. The Hope for Youth Foundation uh, collects money and then uses that money for children's charities, all sorts of charities that helped at St. Jude and uh, uh, Ronald McDonald House and, and others. There are about three dozen different charities, all that work for children who have been dealt a bad hand. And Jim said, why don't we use the money that we get from the calendar, collect all of that money. We don't take any of it, but we'll use that money and, and send it off uh, to all of these charities for, for kids. HUD said, that's great. That's a great idea. So since 1986, Jim has been producing this Hudson Valley long range weather calendar. And I must tell you that in all of the years since 86, all the money that Jim has collected from not just the calendar, but from other events like golf tournaments and uh, uh, dinners and barbecues and whatever, Jim has collected and has contributed to children's charities through the Hope for Youth Foundation, a total of over $6 million. Call him the meteorological Jerry Lewis of the Hudson Valley in New York. But it's all due to this calendar. Now he has been selling this calendar every year since 1986. The new calendar 2024 has just gone out and all of you can get a copy for the nominal fee of just $10. And uh, if you Google Jim, just uh, go on Google and you can type in Jim Witt, comma, weather. Or if you type Hope for Youth Foundation, or if you just go straight to the Hope for Youth Foundation site, you see the uh, URL up here, www.hfyf.org, you will see or you will get uh, with your $10 contribution, this beautiful calendar. And uh, uh, this calendar contains a lot of interesting predictions. In fact, in the back of the calendar, Jim uh, has made forecasts all the way out until, well, let's see, all the way out to uh, 2028 on this page here. He's basing this on things such as high energy cycles on the sun, uh, specific locations of the sun and moon, um, planetary connections. In fact, let's take a look here. 
These are the forecasts taking us through the end of this year. Well, look at this. Write this down. December 12th to 14th and December 17th to 19th, Jim is forecasting using this methodology, some unsettled weather. Will it be a big storm? Well, possibly. We'll have to wait, watch, and see. J Jim's uh, accuracy is pretty good. I have not really, you know, sat down and uh, like a scorecard checked him out, but uh, let's put it this way. If he was wrong every time, or if his forecasts were, were terrible, I don't think he'd be selling as many calendars. He probably would have stopped selling them a long time ago, but uh, he is a very, very well-known, very popular, uh, very reputable name in the lower Hudson Valley of New York. And again, if you want to get a copy of his calendar, certainly uh, it is available to you through Hope for Youth Foundation. Uh, one of the things I disagreed with for a good long time with Jim was his forecasts using the planets. I said, how is it possible that you can use the planets to forecast the weather? I mean, how these planets are millions of miles away from the Earth. So how can their gravitational pull have any influence on our weather? But then some years ago, there was a technical paper that was written by Dennis Kent. Dennis Kent at the Lamont Earth Observatory, Columbia University, back in May of 2018. And in this paper, Dennis Kent wrote, Jupiter and Venus are such strong influences because of their size and proximity. Venus is the nearest planet to us and roughly similar in mass to the Earth. Jupiter is much further away, but it is the solar system's largest planet. And according to Dennis Kent, every 405,000 years, due to wobbles in our orbit caused by the gravitational pulls of these two planets, seasonal differences here on the Earth become more intense. Summers are hotter, winters are colder, dry times are drier, wet times are wetter. So maybe, just maybe, Harry Geis, and perhaps Jim Witt knows something about the movements of the planets and their influence on our weather in conjunction with the sun and the moon. Again, this is a very contentious issue. People out there, you can talk to meteorologists, PhD, uh, global scientists who say, there's a lot of car wash, they're crazy. But there are others just like Jim and, uh, and Harry, uh, who, uh, uh, by the way, passed on some years ago, uh, who have been making these long range forecasts and making them with fairly good success. So we'll see. We'll see how things go and pan out uh, later on in the month. I am no longer doing the weather. I, I spent 40 plus years on radio and television uh, doing the weather. And in fact, for 21 years, I was the chief meteorologist at News 12 in Westchester and uh, provided for. But you know what? Uh, people ask me, well, how accurate are you? I said, I think about 90% accurate. The funny thing is that when I was on the nose with weather forecasts, when I, when I did predict, let's say, properly one to three inches in northern uh, uh, Westchester or in Orange County or Rockland County or whatever, uh, and three to six inches further south, if I got that forecast right, nobody said anything. Nobody, you know, they just said, well, okay, he got it right. But on those rare occasions, and again, they were unusual when I got it wrong, that for whatever reasons, when I heard it from all different quarters, everybody was like, Rayo, you got it wrong. Rayo, what happened? You're crazy. One morning, one day I remember in particular, I forecasted a light snowfall, eh, maybe a coating uh, on the ground. Next morning, I looked out the window. It was snowing to beat the band. There was only like four inches of snow and still coming down. And at that moment, I heard the voice in the back of my mind of Jim Neighbors, who played the role of Gomer Pyle. Surprise, surprise, surprise. It can happen. With all of our technology and all of our knowledge, it still can go through and uh, like, like go through a, a, a hole in the fence. Sometimes something will happen and sometimes you will get it wrong. And that, like I said, I only heard it when I got it wrong, and it wasn't too often I got, I got it wrong. I'm not saying that to boast, but it's, it's a true fact. Uh, but when I did hear from people complaining, uh, both in social media or I get phone calls or emails or whatever, it was when I got it wrong. When I got it right, more often than not, nobody said a word. Well, I'm not the only one who gets that. For example, here's a gentleman who some of you may know uh, or recognize. His name is Bill Buckner. You remember good old Bill Buckner, 
Now, let me tell you something about Bill Buckner, which a lot of you probably don't know. He fell just short of making the Hall of Fame. He had tremendous credentials. He hit 289. That was his lifetime batting average in baseball over an 18 year period. He had 2,715 hits. Eight times in his career, he batted 300 or better. One year in 1980 with the Cubs, he batted 324. Three times he hit or knocked in over 100 runs. And he was also pretty well known as a great fielding outfielder and first baseman. Everything that you possibly would want in a ball player was Bill Buckner. And yet, and sadly, Bill Buckner passed away a few years ago. And yet, what is the thing that everybody remembers or affiliates with Bill Buckner when they hear that name? They think about this one play where the ball went through his legs in game six of the 1986 World Series. Mookie Wilson hit that ball and the winning run came across the plate. The Mets won that game. They came from behind in that game in the 10th inning. And the next night, the Mets won the World Series. And everybody pinned the blame on Bill Buckner. It's almost like the umpire was pointing to Bill Buckner. Here he is. Here's the guy who blew it. But it wasn't really, it was just one, that happens to everybody. But unfortunately, it was magnified because of the fact that it was the World Series. Bill Buckner learned that night what every weather forecaster has learned. It is what I call the weatherman's lament. And here it is. Here is life's great December. Those in the main are our regrets. When we're right, no one remembers. But when we're wrong, no one forgets. Any case, I hope you found this interesting, maybe a little humorous. Maybe you've learned a few things. I'm not really sure. But uh, in any case, I thank you all for listening to me. I did go a bit over my one hour time limit, but uh, I hope that uh, all of you found uh, what I uh, had uh, presented to you uh, of interest. And I thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy now to uh, take whatever questions you may have uh, on, uh, on the chat board. Or actually, why don't you just unmute yourself and you can, uh, you can uh, uh, speak to me directly with whatever questions you may have. And thank you again. Hi, Joe, it's Lydia Maria. How are you? What a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, two quick questions. Was the Herschel that you referred to earlier in the presentation any relationship to William Herschel? I and don't think it was. I don't think it was William Herschel. Okay. Maybe, maybe there were a lot of Herschels who lived back in the 1800s. A lot of Herschels. And uh -huh. is the reason that the storm uh, is so powerful going east, is that because we're going, our Earth is spinning west and it would be just the opposite if it was the opposite? I'm not sure exactly. Are you referring to the... You had mentioned like storms go... Uh, you know, we're going to get very hard. Go. Much I, I did say that if you were on the, if you were east of the storm track, that you would get the worst weather, and that's that simply goes to the fact that in a hurricane, the winds blow around in a, and any low pressure system, they blow around in a counterclockwise fashion, and it just so happens that uh, on the uh, east side of a hurricane or any kind of a major storm, you get what's called warmer advection and a lot of mixing and a lot of turbulence, and so that's why the storms that pass. Uh, uh, to if, if the storm track is to your west, you tend to see uh, a greater amount of wind. And when the storms pass to your east, you end up getting not so much wind, but a lot more in the way of rain. So it's rainier when a significant storm passes by, you tend to see the heaviest rains to the left or to the west of the storm track, but the strongest winds usually occur to the right or to the east of the storm track. And if you just happen to be near the storm track, and a little ways to the west or to the east, you get the worst of, of, of both, the, the, the wind and the rain. And that apparently is what happened with the Saxby Gale in 1869. Thanks, Joe. Joe, this is Jim Witt. It's Jim Witt, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the, Mr. Calendar and Mr. Hope for Youth Foundation. Hi, Jim. How you doing, Joe? Folks, you gotta know this guy is a master. Joe, you are you are the best. We worked together for quite a while years ago, and not only is Joe a great meteorologist, but he is an exceptional astronomer. A uh, great article he has written on the upcoming April eighth, uh, uh, total eclipse of the sun. Joe, I was reading it. 
you just have a way not only with words, but also with verbal presentation. So I, I appreciate what you said about me and what you said about the Hope for Youth Foundation, that we help children. And uh, I've been doing it for 39 years. I'm going to continue to do it until, well, <laughs> until somebody says <laughs> I've done enough. Uh, so anyway, I just want to let you know, I thought your presentation tonight on a scale of one to 10 being 10, the best, it was probably 15 and a half. Oh, thank you, Jim. It was thank really you. good, Joe. You, you touched on so many important issues and yes, of course, we, we know so little about what we are doing, but I done, I've done 59 years of it. I don't expect to stop. And uh, I think I, I'm not stupid enough to do it for 59 years if I didn't think there is some validity to it. Simple as that. And you actually, and I, I'm, I'm correct now, you, you saw that prediction by Harry Geis on Channel 2, asked for a meeting, and he actually said to you that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you not the whole ball of wax, but I'm going to give you enough so that you can try to figure it out for yourself. Is that, is that correct? Or that? Oh, he, he told me quite a bit and he said, you can share this with your youngsters. He said, because it appears that you are uh, a very dedicated teacher like he was. And he taught me how to do what he did for that December snowstorm. Uh, way back in October and November, he predicted it. And uh, I figured out how he did it. And uh, well, I, I I have quite a few, uh, I have some knowledge of what I'm doing, of course, uh, maybe from the floor to the ceiling, if that's long range, maybe I got an inch and a half off the floor. <laughs> but, but the thing that I think is most important, uh, folks, is that um, the people who are uh, in charge today of uh, the, uh, the National Weather Service and at, at NOAA, in fact, one of the computer models that all meteorologists use, the GFS model, uh, the, the person who is in charge of uh, that particular model uh, or who has made tweaks or changes to that model over the past few years, that person was one of Jim's students at Lakeland High School back in the 1960s. <laughs> he, was, he was inspired by Jim to move on to uh, bigger and better things at, in weather. And again, uh, this uh, that's not just one isolated case. There are others who have gone on to do a lot of great stuff in the field of meteorology. And this man that you're hearing right now, Jim Witt, was the guy who uh, inspired them and got them got them rolling on 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 that. And uh, uh, what more can I possibly say? He, had, he got a, an award from the American Meteorological Society some years back for his uh, education in uh, in, uh, in weather and uh, say what you will about people who, you know, can purportedly or supposedly make long range predictions, whether you think of it as interesting or whether or not you think it's a lot of hogwash or whatever. Despite all of that, Jim has been out there, as he said, for a number of years and uh, continues to help uh, young children with his long range calendar. And I hope every one of you um, perhaps has a chance to, uh, this is not a commercial, Jim. Uh, <laughs> no. but you, but I think, I think if you, if you want to, uh, uh, at least have a nice calendar so you can put your dates on for the upcoming year, uh, get, get the calendar. And, uh, if you have something of interest that you're interested in for, uh, an event, um, uh, for next year, uh, get the calendar and, uh, we'll see how it all pans out. Joe, what's interesting, the first year we did 1,000 calendars. This year we did 20,000. Wow. So it's been growing uh, year by year. So, you know, people are trying. They, I tell you, they, they go very quickly. And he but goes, and Jim, Jim, by the way, folks, goes, you know, he just doesn't sit there and say, buy my calendar. On, on weekends, he goes to places in and around the Hudson Valley to uh, – to uh, uh, shops and to restaurants and to diners and to all, all <laughs> places, sits down and he doesn't just spend an hour there. Jim, my God, Jimmy, you, you spend like four hours sometimes sitting there, uh, pressing the flesh, and also uh, um, 
getting to uh, uh, meet people and uh, signing, aut autographing the calendar, taking selfies, I guess. Oh, this is the great Jim Witt. <laughs> Joe, I'm going to be at Uncle Giuseppe this Saturday. Uncle you know Gi where that is? No. Uncle Giuseppe. And oh, my God, it's a huge, huge store in Yorktown that does a tremendous business. And uh, I'm going to sit outside. Uh, and Saturday should be a good day. I'll bring my little table and a chair, and I'll see if uh, people want to buy the calendar. Well, I, I'll tell you what, Jim. I would be there with you, or it's, it's going to be like 50 to 55. It's a great day for all of you to put up your Christmas decorations outside. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending upon my aspect here, I'm going to be uh, doing something that day. I'm going to be shuttling my wife and my sister um and also uh upstairs we have some relatives of my uh, wife who are upstairs they're all here for this saturday for a baby shower my uh my daughter-in-law is going to be uh giving birth uh oh. in early early next year and i'm going to become grandpa joe uh, <laughs> and i'm going to become grandpa joe on a very significant day and weather i said did you actually plan for this uh, the the due date is February second, Groundhog Day. So oh. <laughs> we'll see if he sees his shadow, Joe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. What a great presentation! The people had to learn a tremendous amount tonight. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else have any questions before we sign off? If not, then I really want to thank you, Joe. I thought that was very informative. Chat is full of thank yous to you, Joe. Well, again, I appreciate it. I thank you. I've, uh, if I didn't like, like Jim said just a few moments ago, if I didn't like what I was doing, I wouldn't have spent all this time just blibbering away of <laughs> the last hour and a half about weather and astronomy and, and, and whatnot. So thanks very much. And uh, uh, we'll be back, uh, hopefully, down the road sometime. All right. Have a wonderful night, everybody. You too. Have fun, folks. Bye-bye.